Hi, I'm Jane Hayes. Well, tonight I'm here in my capacity as Director of Keyboard Studies for the Music Department at Kwantlen, but also as musical colleague with Francois Houle clarinet in our duo, which is called Sea and Sky. And we're basically exploring repertoire for the wonderful world of clarinet piano. So Sea and Sky basically is all about discovering gorgeous sound, whether it's in traditional music settings or whether it's in experimental settings like we'll do tonight. We're calling it a sensory sound experience because so often music is something which is a part of everyone's lives. Everybody has something, you know, favorite that they listen to. So what we want to invite the audience to do tonight is to start off with the idea of what does a clarinet sound like? What does a piano sound like? What do they sound like together? And then we're going to present new music for clarinet and piano or relatively unknown pieces. Francois is also a composer, not only a, a phenomenal clarinetist who crosses all genres, but he composes, and again, he's right out there in terms of techniques. So we'll end the evening with, in a sense, improvisation using the piano, but also using some of his looping and, and samples to show you how you just take the idea of sound and experience it. Hi everyone, nice to see you here on such a lovely spring evening. Um, on behalf of the university, I want to say uh, welcome to all of you and a special thank you to Science World for their ongoing support and collaboration on the KPU Science World project. Each of you received a survey tonight. Um, we would appreciate it if you could fill it out at the end of the evening. There's an entry form at the bottom of the survey and we encourage you to fill it out and drop it off before you leave for a chance to win a prize. Tonight is the final installment of the KPU Science World Speaker Series of this season, but we will be having another season, so um, watch out for information about the next series that will be starting. Um, actually, in May or June, we're going to have another session. So tonight's presenters, Francois Uhl and Jane Hayes, both music instructors at KPU and the clarinet piano duo, better known as Sea and Sky, have been collaborating for over 10 years to bring fascinating and unusual programs to new audiences across Canada. Having performed together as members of Turning Point Ensemble and Vancouver New Music Ensemble, these two outstanding musicians explore the clarinet and piano repertoire to uncover rarely heard gems, delighting audiences regardless of era, genre, and style. Sea and Sky recently recorded Zara Bandeo, featuring works bound together by the Latin hallmarks of infectious rhythm and exquisite melody. The accolades have already rolled in for these recordings with reviews praising the excellence of their musicianship, interpretive prowess, and an undying willingness to experiment. Last March, their CD, Sassy Kaya, was nominated for a West Coast Music Award for Best New Classical Recording. And I'm going to ask, does anybody in the audience know what Sassy Kaya is? No? Francois, I think you know. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you want to tell them? It's a really famous Tuscan wine. <laughs> there you go, a really famous Tuscan wine. So this summer, joining uh, Jane and Francois will be violinist Joan Blackman, former associate concertmaster for the VSO and artistic director for the VEDA Chamber Series. Together, they'll be performing throughout the Lower Mainland, Vancouver Island, and the Gulf Islands, further expanding the repertoire of sea and sky. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Jane Hayes and Francois Houle for Sea and Sky. Good evening. It's so wonderful to see you here on what I think is one of our only sunny nights in March. All right, so actually, hopefully we can keep that sun going for the next hour or so. The reason behind sensory music experience, so often we all have a piece which we go to, you know, when we're feeling sad, when we're feeling happy, when we want to chill. And so often, music has that emotional connection for all of us. But sometimes we forget that music is also an art form. And just like in painting, you have you know, your wonderful landscapes, pretty flowers. Maybe it's a portrait. Well, in music, we have similar abstract things. 
Artists turned towards, I still remember seeing a canvas that was red. And I looked at that canvas and thought, OK, not for me. Sometimes that happens in music. But what we do with sound is we, we seek to explore. We seek to challenge. As you were assembling, I don't know how many of you noticed what was going on in the background. That was from the Sasakaya CD, and it was actually the very first piece that got Francois and I on a roll towards producing the CD. That was written by a Quebec composer, Paul Dolden. He spends all of his creative time in a little cottage just told away, and his specialty creating electroacoustic tracks that live musicians play with. He challenged us to go to the ends of the earth on our instruments. I was explaining to our president that after our recording session, I actually had to go for massage therapy right away because he just, he drove my arm crazy and he kept saying, can you play louder? And it's kind of like, okay, I'll try. So, you know, there are challenges with that. But tonight what we're going to do is take your ears on a bit of a journey. We want to play for you what is traditional clarinet and piano and then show you how, no, you, you can start to explore all sorts of other sounds. So your benchmark this evening is a piece by Anthony Genge, an amazing um, educator. He's actually a professor at St. Francis Xavier University on the East Coast, but he spends a lot of time on the West Coast as a jazz pianist. And yet his eclectic interests are such that in this piece, well, he shamelessly uses a technique from the Renaissance called hocket, while combining and actually plagiarizing a piece by Olivier Messiaen, which is called the Quartet for the End of Time, and just sticks these little fragments into something which he described as Latin-inspired funk, or perhaps a hyperkinetic cartoon music. Now what's going to happen here is you're going to get a chance to hear what clarinet sounds like alone, piano alone, the two of us together. The Hockett idea, well, we never really play any more than two different notes at a time. So you're going to hear us pass this amazing little rhythmic thing back and forth. And it tells you this is the traditional sound of clarinet and piano, but done in a really kind of forward-looking way. Thank you. 
when you think about it, with the exception of the human voice, all instruments are inventions. So it's very appropriate in science world to think about, well, when did this all start? And of course, with keyboard instruments, they began their lives as something very portable, something very small. The virginal, for instance, a very tiny little keyboard instrument with a two octave range, not very many notes to play on at all. And very small because, well, strings were made from cat gut, just like the violin. So over time, the piano evolved. It came from the idea of an organ where there was wind to make sound. The idea of the harpsichord where you had something inside that was plucking. And it was an Italian named Cristofori who came up with the idea of, well, let's have a harpsichord type body, but let's hit. So the hammer was developed, operated by a mechanism. All right, basically the idea of hit, strike, and control volume, hence the name piano forte something that could play soft, something that could play strong. What happened with the Industrial Revolution? Well, originally, you've probably heard the wonderful urban myth of Beethoven tearing his piano apart. He would play so loud that it would shatter. Well, the frame was originally entirely made of wood. Again, not terribly durable. So as the Industrial Revolution developed the iron frame, we started to get strings that were bound with copper, so they started to get stronger, longer, and so louder, more durable, and no longer portable at all. The clarinet had a different kind of origin. Yes. Ooh, mine is louder than yours. <laughs> Technology. Um, yes, well, the clarinet started off as just a, a, a pipe made out of uh, cane, uh, hollowed uh, cane. And the reed that actually makes the sound on the instrument uh, was just cut out of the tube itself. Um, and eventually in the 17th, 18th century, it evolved to be called a chalumeau, which was actually a, a recorder uh, maker in Nuremberg uh, named J.C. Denner, who had the idea of putting a single reed mouthpiece at the end of, of a recorder. And he discovered that the, the properties of this, the instrument changed completely. He was able to get notes that were much lower than what he expected at first um, that was possible on a treble recorder. And um, so they called it the Chalumeau and eventually he started adding keys to it to expand the length of the, uh, of, of the register. And, uh, and that became the, uh, basically the precursor of the modern clarinet. Uh, the clarinet evolved by adding more keys to it so that uh, instead of just playing in a few limited uh, key areas, um, they were able to turn the instrument into a, a chromatic instrument, so able to actually play in all 12 different keys. And the repertoire that was developed as the technical advances of the instrument evolved um, made it so that we have an instrument now that's got 18 keys and 21 keys and some instruments I even have up to 24 different keys. The, the standard one has got uh, 18 keys, uh, which made the task of the clarinetist that much more complicated by negotiating all these different, uh, you know, uh, fingerings and whatnot. So, but the, uh, another thing that's interesting about the instrument is it's got, it's got a lot of different parts and I can't take them apart while holding a microphone at the same time. But you'll see in the next piece uh, that the, the, the composer, Adolf Schreiner, um, who's a late romantic composer, uh, thought of this little piece where all kinds of strange things happen using the technology of the clarinet the way it's built nowadays uh, or even back then. And um, so he created a set of variations that makes the clarinet do all kinds of very, very funny things. Uh, a little hint is that Immer Kleiner in English actually means uh, ever smaller, right? Yeah. So you'll see what happens. And the good news <laughs> is the composer called this a, a humorous clarinet fantasy, which could only be played on a waning moon. 
I checked this morning, it is a waning crescent. We're good to go. I'm turning around so that you folks over there can see what's going on too. Yes, you're welcome.
Thank you. Um, I'll just go through this. You go, I go ahead? Yeah, I can go ahead. Okay. Um, so, as you can see, there's, there's five different parts, six different parts to the clarinet, actually, if you count the reed, which is attached to the last part. If I took the reed off, nothing would happen. <laughs> um, this piece is a lot of fun because it, it, it just forces you to, to rethink all kinds of little things that what happens to intonation when you take a whole part of the instrument and trying to play di diatonically, chromatically with it when there's a whole bunch of keys and lengths of tubes missing uh, is actually quite challenging uh, and kind of ridiculous at the same time. Yeah, what you might not notice is we started here. When the instrument gets, got smaller, we went here. When it got smaller, we actually went here. And then we ended here. <laughs> so the piece itself is completely backwards. It doesn't subscribe to anything, and hence this idea of, yeah, humorous fantasy. But it shows you that even though this was written kind of the turn of the 20th century, composers were already starting to think about, well, did you always have to leave, for instance, the clarinet together? Now again, fortunately for my instrument, it was still growing, all right? It started off a typical grand piano, might have been about four foot six. The one you're looking at here is seven foot. I'm used to playing on nine foots when you go to play with an orchestra. So because my instrument is so large, in many ways, I got left behind a little longer in terms of what kind of special techniques can I do using this instrument? So the next piece, we want to now start to ask you, you've heard normal, you've heard something very silly. Now we want you to start, <laughs> he just is. Now I want you to listen to, it's um, a very short excerpt from the actual piece called Sasakaya. This is written by Bruce Mather, an amazing Montreal composer. So if we could ask for track six from behind the blue door. Get somebody there. <laughs> so what's he doing? What am I doing? Okay. You could say he might need clarinet lessons. <laughs> and is there really nothing more I can do to life than just play single notes? What's he doing? And you can turn the CD off, please. We could try that again. You could turn the CD off, please. Thank you. There we go. That's good. Yeah, OK. Um, so when I was saying that the, the, the instrument makers had to add a bunch of different keys so that we could play chromatically, play a whole chromatic scale, basically all the white notes and the black notes on the piano, um, something that uh, that was neglected was all the different possibilities in between those notes. So the quarter tones and the eighth of tones. So clarinetists, clever as they are, um, figured out that by adding um, uh, extra fingers and, and keys to regular fingerings, uh, we could get in between those notes. And uh, there's a, a really um, great composer in Montreal, uh, an old professor of mine named Bruce Mather, who's also uh, one of the greatest North American test of vin. He's a specialist of, of wines. And uh, he, uh, whenever you get commissioned uh, to write pieces of music, especially chamber music and small uh, chamber orchestra pieces, he would name them after famous wines. And uh, when, when, when he found out that I actually had learned his piece, Sasakaya, um, and performed it several times um, over the course of my career, um, 
he, he actually was kind enough to send me a case of this really great wine. So now it's one of my favorite pieces to perform. <laughs> and I realize I don't have a microphone in hand. I hope you can hear me uh, because it, it is a great story. Um, anyway, uh, but w what he specialized in after a little while was to compose uh, with his um, pianist wife, uh, Pierrette Mather, um, uh, pieces for two pianos uh, tuned an eighth of tone apart. Uh, so that when they perform together, they can actually play in unison, but they can al also play in between the white notes and the, and, the, and the black notes on the piano. And he composes these pieces that, that have this sort of ethereal quality. And when he wrote a Sasekaya for clarinet and piano, he was interested in making the piano go out of tune. But of course, we can't do that live unless you have like a hammer and bricks and mortar and <laughs> all kinds of things. Uh, so he uses uh, the um, uh, scales that are tuned in eighth of tone on the clarinet uh, to play along with the piano. So that the way that he has it organized is that if I play all the notes that I'm asked to play in quarter tones and eighths of tones, I actually make it sound like the piano is actually out of tune, not the clarinet, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Um, so anyway, we, shall we try? Um, uh, I, I can show you a few examples of, of quarter tone, uh, detuned clarinet type of thing, but what I'd rather do is just play the piece itself, and you will be uh, the judge of who's actually going out of tune. With this, we'll play an excerpt for you. What's fun with the piano is he actually has me silently depress a whole bunch of keys at the bottom hold it with the middle pedal, which was a modern invention, again, turn of the 20th century. So what you're going to hear from the piano is there's a lot of reverb. I strike notes very sharply, but they won't go away. And then you'll hear, as I say, how my notes come out of Francois, and as he says, it makes it sound like I'm wrong, but I don't have any choice. So what is your perception of that live? There we go. I got, I got to prove it at some point then. Yeah. Well, we had fun when we recorded this. We had the benefit of Karen Wilson, who is an amazing CBC music producer. And she was so funny because when we recorded this, she goes, I can't help you. <laughs> Whereas on everything else, she was just so nitpicky. This is a little flat. This is sharp. That piano note is funny. Watch out. This one, she just said, if you guys say it's OK, it is. <laughs> All right. Now, there are things that piano 
instruments can do. And since we're classed as percussion, and if any of you have seen the piano guys by any chance? No? They're really fun. They take the piano and they basically say, anything goes. So I can hit it, I can strum it, I can find amazing sounds. So here are some samples of what I can do without altering. So far we haven't really done anything other than Francoise played out of tune. But for me, you know, I'm just using my piano in the normal way. But what can I do? Pedal down. put notes down. Those of you up close will hear something's there. Activate. Finish. Now that was written in the 50s by Francois Morel. So often the French we look to French composers Debussy Ravel as the impressionist using you know sound much like the painters use just dots of color to create images. So that particular use was me depress, depressing the keys while actually doing what was called the harmonic series. That my instrument resonates different ways and that's what makes it sound like a piano, just like the clarinet has its own harmonic series and it gives it its own particular timbre. Pianists can play inside the piano, and then I'm more or less like a harpist, or I'm even like a violinist where you play harmonics. I can play a note. I can find that note and start to create other sounds. Better example down here. Here's my note. Here's what I can do to it. I can find all sorts of different bell like sounds. I divide the strings. And the challenge, of course, as you can see, even from what I'm doing right now, is when they put me on a nine foot piano and they ask me to do this, it's really hard. I always have to wear heels like I am tonight, otherwise, oh, there's a nice one. So, sound, different sound. So I can use harmonics like that. And one of the composers who wrote for us exploited that idea of me doing harmonics while Francois does multi Phonics. I'll just demonstrate and then we'll talk about it. <laughs> Maybe. So, yeah. so uh, I should just say that multitonics obviously is many sounds or many frequencies. So the pianist can just play chords. So we, we have to do crazy things in order to get more than one note at a time. But we can do it. That's just basically overtones that we can accentuate by breaking down the air column into different parts. Just like the violinist will put his finger on different parts of the string to, to get uh, harmonics. A lot of fun. Um, there's a composer in town, a uh, conductor and uh, a great uh, person. His name is Owen Underhill. Uh, composed a piece for us after he heard me do these uh, duotones. And, uh, Apney Lane named the piece Duotone. And, uh, and Jane is doing all kinds of weird preparations inside the piano, and there's this beautiful little section into the piece where he's using some of my favorite uh, uh, multiphonics and, uh, and gets Jane to do all kinds of contortions. <laughs> 
So we'll play a little bit of that for you. The frame on this piano is in the wrong spot. <laughs> oh, okay. Complicate matters. <laughs> Beautiful playing, Jane. <laughs> the magic pluck. That happens an awful lot inside the piano. So I can pluck, but I can also do lots of preparations. So I just happen to preset certain things. The piano is strung so that in the bass you have single strings. About Oh, not even an octave in, we go to double. Up high, we go to triple strings. So it's amazing the lengths that composers will go to to create sounds other than this. So, let me see where I put those. Huh. Normal. Normal. What have I got inside the piano? Make me stop. What do you think that is? Nail. No. I've put screws. No. Anybody like to golf? So I've played a piece by Stephen Chapman where I had about 15 of these little darlings inside the upper part of the piano and it was a piece that was involving birds. So you could imagine it was an amazing kind of really dry kind of sound while I could still use a lot of the piano for other things. Okay, normal. It's not a golf tee. Yeah, even Francois looking. <laughs> Good old sticky tack. That goes back into a different generation when teachers would, you know, use that to put it on the board. So I spend a lot of time in dollar stores for these composers trying to find things. And this actually was used by a Montreal composer, Anna Sokolovich, and the Turning Point Ensemble that we we're part of did an amazing piece by her which has just been nominated for a Juno. If you ever listen to it, it involves this as well as some other amazing things. Ah, uh, don't look. What the heck's that? Exactly. Anybody who has a grand or if you happen to be a music teacher, gosh, the number of times paper falls in and music happens. <laughs> All right. So it's amazing where composers spend a lot of time just saying, do anything. Okay. What do you want me to do? Hit this. <laughs> Thank you. 
anything is game. I've used mallets, all different persuasions. The craziest preparation involved 43 Phillips screws, for which I required special dispensation from Tom Lee music. And the piano technician actually had to be standing behind me, instructing me on the proper use of Phillips screws. Apparently, there isn't one. Francois? Yeah. Well, in similar fashion, uh, there's all kinds of ways of preparing a clarinet. And, um, uh, but there's something that we do naturally is that we use our tongue hitting the reed to, to create articulation, like tonguing, staccatos, and things like that. Um, but there's various things that you can do to modify it and make it even more percussive. And there's a thing on the clarinet called slap tongue. And the reason why we bring it up is that this next composer uh, uh, heard me do this on several occasions and thought, what, can I, how do I write that? How do I include that into my own compositions? So I tried to explain it to, to her a little bit. She was baffled, but she wrote using it nonetheless. And, um, and something that I also introduced uh, this composer to uh, was this uh, rare earth magnets. Um, and uh, so she decided to prepare the piano using some of these magnets. And you'll see that, that, that it's a very effective way of preparing the piano without damaging it. <laughs> um, so anyway, a slap tongue sounds like this. Um, I'll just give you a, a short example. sounds like a, an African log drum type of effect, right? So I'll, I'll improvise with that a little bit later on using my looper. We'll, we'll get to this and talk about the use of electronics on top of what we do as instrumentalists and how we can coax composers into using all kinds of these weird techniques to enhance their music. Um, you're almost ready? Uh, keep talking. Yeah, I'll just talk about keep the name of the piece. talking. No, not really. It's called, <laughs> I will, it's called traffic. Um, but it's traffic, apparently, in, 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 uh, in uh, the etymology of the word actually means a lot more than just what we know as traffic in North America, uh, which can be very irritating. Um, but I think it, 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 my, my proclivity for playing fast music uh, and jazz and improvisation uh, just made her, think, made her think of how we, we live in a very you know, in an urban environment that can be very stressful at times, but um, we can also look at traffic as a very musical thing. If you close your eyes and hear the Doppler effects of, of car passing bys and honking horns, it's actually an interesting cacophony that, that has some musical quality and it's certainly a very r frenetic rhythm. So she tried to write this little piece uh, for us. Um, it's about uh, just over a minute long and the, the, Jane and I had this idea of, of commissioning composers to write pieces that were shorter than two minutes. And we love her piece because it's the shortest of the lot. <laughs> and most composers actually have so much to say that they usually fail into this idea of writing a piece that's shorter than two minutes long or a minute and 30 seconds. So we're going to play this piece of, uh, of Jackie Leggett's called Traffic. Thank you. 
So the funky sound, those are all magnets individually placed. It takes almost longer to prepare the piano than it does to play the piece. But the effect itself is really fun and it's, it's challenging. All of those notes in my music are red because the pianist is trained that we see lots of notes all the time and we expect to hear a pitch. And it's really disconcerting. So I'm so glad she did color them for me so that I could go, whatever, okay, <laughs> whatever. Now, taking the magnets out, fortunately, doesn't take much time. And what we're going to head into now is the idea that, well, who says you even have to play the piano? Uh, the next piece is by a composer, a great friend of mine, again, uh, who raised the challenge of writing these short pieces. His is a little bit longer, but the, but the amount of notes you could easily fit within 10 seconds. But he stretches it out. Uh, over five, six minutes. Uh, we're only going to do about half of that piece, about three minutes, the first three minutes of it. That's just the magnets coming off the strings. Um, and the idea that he had was that, what if, what if we wrote a piece where the piano actually never really hit the keyboard? And, and I don't think you really do, do you, hit the keyboard in it? Um, and he uses a, a piece of technology that's commonly used for, for guitar players. It was invented for electric guitars, but um, he thought, what happens if you put these gizmos inside the piano? And I'm not going to say any more because it's quite mysterious what actually happens. And uh, I only play a handful of notes uh, as well, and, but the, the result is quite, quite magical. It's a piece called Bliss Point.
So the, the gizmos are called the uh, ebos, the electronic bows. So they just keep the, the vibration of the ring going after you've triggered the, the start of it. And uh, it creates for quite a ethereal sort of little effect. Um, the use of electronics is becoming more and more uh, a part of the recital going experience. So w we might play a piece by Brahms and then uh, jump into a, a new music that's going to use ebos and extended techniques like slap tonguing and prepared piano and things like that. Um, and I, I've, of course, like, like a lot of, of people of my generation, performers, we, we, we learned this piece of technology, this interface called the clarinet or the piano. And it's nice to be able to enhance it with all kinds of uh, other uh, uh, electronic means. And composers have been very proactive at getting used to writing with these, this technology, but also um, improvisers and, uh, and people in jazz and you know, the, the advent of fusion and electronic music uh, have become uh, s slowly uh, infiltrated uh, th this notion of going to the recital hall and expecting electronics to, to affect us, affect the music. And uh, we're going to play a little improvisation for you that, you know, th th that inspired me. This is a composition of mine or an improvisation idea of mine where uh, the, the initial impetus was that very often when you say to a venue uh, when you're traveling and going to Europe or, or the States or anywhere in the world and you're going to say, oh, I, I'm going to prepare your beautiful $100,000 Steinway Grand that you've invested all this money in that you cherish and love and uh, we're actually going to totally mess it up for you. And, uh, anyway, th there's a lot of venues that refuse unless you have a, an actual written form from Steinway or Yamaha that says that your pr preparation process actually won't damage the piano. They won't let you even do it. Or they'll pull out the shittiest piano that they have <laughs> in the third basement that's been sitting in a moth closet, you know. Uh, <laughs> usually, yeah. Or a crystal transparent piano that even Liberace wouldn't touch. And, uh, and uh, so I said, well, I've got this idea of actually uh, preparing the piano where we don't even have to, to, to touch the piano itself. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show you what it sounds like a little bit. Okay. Thank you. 
the whole idea for me anyway, at this point, in playing the clarinet and working with Jane and working with composers who have all these crazy ideas, to integrate the technology in a musical situation where we don't know where the music, the, the live playing ends and the, the processed material starts. So in this case, you could hear that at, at the end that I, I'd actually recorded into this looper all this material and, and that totally matched in color and sound and dynamic what we're doing live and then we just stop playing and let the machine take over and then we can bend it and make it things that there's no way that we could possibly do with our instruments. So it expands the potential and the range of expression that, that we have at our disposition. If you use it well, it can actually surprise and create all kinds of beautiful, magical moments. So while we can then take sound, so hopefully tonight what you've realized is that, yeah, the sky's the limit. These are not things where you have to have a predisposed idea that you're going to hear a melody, you're going to hear this, you're going to hear great virtuosity. Music can sometimes be v very static where, yeah, you, you revel in sound like that piece called Bliss Point with the Ebos. When we perform that piece, we do it in pretty much a darkened room. We don't need to see anything. I know what notes to start depressing, and I, I don't have a very hard job in that other than push the right one at the right time. There are a few effects that we didn't show you with the ebos where I can press on the strings and get them to rattle, but it doesn't matter. That's a piece where, no, there's no rhythm. It's just, it is this sensory experience. So hopefully we've just opened your ears a little bit to the idea that, no, 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 there, there's all sorts of things that are possible. Music is not always that which we go to in times of solace. But we also know that that kind of music will always be present in the world. Those special pieces that you can hear over and over and over again. And we'll end our presentation tonight with one such piece. It's something where every time we do it, it's different. It's by Astor Piazzolla, the king of the tango, and it's his wonderful piece, Oblivion, from the movie Henry IV.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again the last piece? Astor Piazzolla. Astor He's the king, yeah. P I A Z Z O L L A. Okay, great, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, amazing this tango. Is this is called Oblivion. Oblivion, okay, yeah. Thank you. Very out of the blue question, but uh, have you ever tried to make. Uh, very different sounds using water, I mean, fluids? Yes. I, I actually, um, I don't do it with this clarinet because it's, it's a, a special wood, a rare wood called cocobolo. Um, but I, I have a plastic clarinet at home, and, uh, and I have this special sort of um, vase sculpture that my brother-in-law uh, made for me, where I can actually fill it up with water and play with the clarinet right into the water. And it, it makes really, really cool sounds. <laughs> um, and and um, I've, I don't think I've ever seen any, any other clarinet players actually use it, you know? Um, but it, 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 it really um, bends the pitches and does all kinds of really cool bubbly effects. <laughs> so yes. Um, mm -hmm. And no for me. <laughs> yeah. There's, a, there's also a technique that I've seen saxophone players do it a lot, where they'll actually use the condensation inside the instrument. Um, you know, you probably see it dripping all the time when I'm playing, which is just blowing warm air into a tube. So there's condensation that happens. Uh, but often, like sax soprano saxophone players will actually lift the instrument so the condensation will go against the reed. So you hear those sort of uh, weird spittle type of effect. Uh, which is very unwanted when you're playing a beautiful concerto <laughs> by, you know, Debussy or something. Um, so we, we do this thing where we, we swab the instrument a whole lot to avoid that. Uh, but when you're improvising, um, uh, because that's actually my main practice now is, is improvising uh, rather than playing repertoire, although we do a lot of that too, um, where accidents are a means for stumbling upon new sounds or new ideas, you know, and, uh, and, and working with all the limitations and, and things that happen to the instruments are part of our fair game, basically. So uh, I've, working with water, it, it sort of happened as a, as a joke, actually. There's a photo on the internet, if you go look and Google my name, where you'll see me playing into, actually, um, a glass of beer. <laughs> <laughs> And that, and, and, and that was actually like the first time that I ever was crazy enough to dip my clarinet bell into any kind of liquid, and it had to be beer. As, you know, I'm a good Canadian boy, I guess. Um, and then I figured, okay, well, you know, I, let's try water. Maybe it, it'll be less soporific. Um, Is there a different sound between beer and water? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> it's funny, what, I'll, I'll get to you, but one of the questions that I ask, that, that I get asked often is like, uh, what, what, are you, what are you reading off and what are you doing with your foot all the time in the middle of these pieces? And it's actually a, a, a Bluetooth page turner and all my music, my whole catalog of over 800 classical compositions and, and, and method books and, and everything are, it, on my iPad, and I turned, I don't know if you can see it, but I, I turned my pages with my foot, you know. So it's, it's, and the beautiful thing about it is that as I'm getting older and I need better prescription for my eyes, the, the iPad is backlit. So I never have problems saying, oh, there's not enough light, I can't read my music. And I play in a lot of really funky venues that serve a lot of beer. And, uh, and this is God's gift to uh, old clarinet players, I'll tell you. Uh, yes? It's just a question about the red notes. And so how yes. do you know when you go through that, and the same with your producer's um, experience, that you've done it right? Or does it really matter? 
Um, it does matter because the composer's instructions were to have pitch still discernible. So there's still enough of a hint. So what, what I did is I made sure I knew what I expected to hear because then I know for sure that I hit the correct black or white note. And it is interesting where you can argue sometimes it sounds so arbitrary maybe to you, but once we know the piece, oh my gosh, if we miss something, it's glaring to us. All right. Um, sometimes with the magnets, they move around. You can appreciate that while they're earth magnets, as Francois said, so they're incredibly hard. Like I had to make sure they were all separated out because otherwise it takes me forever. And if my hands are at all greasy, I can't get the things apart to begin with. So then he has to really talk a long time. So, um, yeah, which you hate doing. <laughs> Yeah, so, so with it, sometimes they will actually move. And so like even in, in the recording process, we have to stop and it's kind of like reposition the little darlings and one more time. So that's always the danger with anything to do with preparations. Um, today, I, I knew I needed fishing line. Unfortunately, I didn't have any rosin because my son had taken his violin and he took the rosin with it. And I'm going, what could I use? I tried glue stick, it failed. I mean, this is what happens with, with these kind of things, you know. So you try your best, but it's like anything. It's, it's a little bit of a crapshoot what's going to happen depending on the piano. Uh, maybe we could say something about that if you want to just hit the controller. Uh, so the, the idea behind my little improvisation, improvisatory piece at the end is that instead of preparing the piano, um, what I did is that I, I sat in a studio and did all the preparations that I wanted to the, to the, to the piano and recorded them and created a, a whole sample bank, a, a sampler basically that's all prepared piano. And uh, like if you just want to... So that's just basically knocking in and on the metal frame of the piano inside. So I just sampled that. And when we do these performances, uh, I basically have a, a, a full sample piano. If you change the octaves on it, you'll get different sounds and rattles and whatnot, and which would take a long time in a live situation to prepare. But we have them all canned up and, uh, and ready to go. And so venues love me <laughs> because I don't destroy their instrument. But, uh, uh, but the beautiful thing with that is that then I, I can actually compose some pieces that use prepared piano while Jane can just play the piano normally as well. And we can launch into all these really, really cool improvisations that explore all these ex extraneous sounds and whatnot. Um, and, and I use a, 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 a looper um, to capture some of those sounds and capture some of the elements that I do on the clarinet and I can modify it with various electronic means. So uh, I like to do it with sort of like a more traditional uh, setup and then add to it and transform it as we go because it really creates a magical moment where you don't know uh, where is the fine line between the real and the imagined or the, 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 the reality and the process. You know. And technology allows you to do that.